on your Jump, 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 jump. What we don't start it. Look at what we don't start it. This the people party. What's up, party people? It's Talib Kweli, the BKMC, the MCEO. Welcome to another fantastic edition of the People's Party Show. I got my wonderful co-host Jasmine Lee in the house. How you doing, Jasmine? I am chilling. Over here getting hyphy. Now, you getting hyphy? Yeah, baby. Oh, you sound like you're from California. I am. Now, today is a very Cali episode because this gentleman that we have today, he is from California. He's born in Los Angeles, but he quickly moved from Los Angeles to the Bay Area, and he is synonymous with the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. This is the OG that your OGs respect. This is the OG that your OGs want to do songs with. You understand what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Ladies and gentlemen, we got the Bay Area's own Too Short in the motherfucking house. What's up, Short? What's up, man? How you doing, bro? How you feeling? Doing good, man, out here, you know, surviving the game, doing no it. No doubt. A lot of people don't know that you and I work together on a Strong Arm Steady song. We've done we've done stuff. We've I've, done some things together. Yeah, we yeah. spent some time hanging out in nightclubs. Exactly. DJ know? booths, all that all stuff. All that stuff. Word up. Yeah. Um, shout out to Strong Arm Steady, uh, Phil the Agony, Cron Don, Mitchie Slick. Okay. The short was featured on the song and in the video on Point that I put out when I was uh, rocking with Blacksmith. Um, so, yeah, you were born in Los Angeles. Yeah, I spent the young years in L.A. and then right. Uh, like right when that time, you know, it, it was actually like right when I first heard hip hop. I heard hip hop for the first time mm -hmm. in 79, like, you know, coming off the, uh, you know, the uh, Rappers Delight Knows records mm -hmm. that, that went national. And I just immediately was like, this is what I want to do. Right. Like, immediately. So when I moved to Oakland, that's when I started rapping. So that's, that's right. I was, why it's always associated with the Bay. It was all everything in the rap was Bay. It was just, you know. So people who don't know California, because mm -hmm. when I was first coming to California back in the days, you know, we don't know the difference between L.A. and Fresno and uh, Sacramento, different Oakland. World, different worlds. What's the difference between the Bay and, like, uh, Southern California? I, I like to tell people that, um, that don't know the geography. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, let's say if you're from New York. Mm -hmm. Crib. And just picture um, where, how far can you get in mm -hmm. five hours on, mm -hmm. the, on the highway? Right. D.C. is what, DC, four? D.C., yeah. Virginia. Okay, so that's how far right. L.A. is from the Bay. Right. It's a five-hour, six-hour drive in the car. It's a whole different Five place. the way I drive, probably four right. and a half. But the difference is, it's like, I mean, look how close New York is to Philly and how different you are. That's right. Like, we're way further apart than mm -hmm. that. And it's like, you hear, when you're not from outside, you're like, get in the car, you hear the accent. Mm -hmm. But if you're from the Bay in L.A., we, we kind of hear each other a little different, you know? You right. Can, you can just see. It just takes a moment. You're like, oh, you're from the Bay. Oh, you're from L.A. You're like, you know. Right. Now, the hyphy sound. Mm -hmm. How did that start? So you take a, um, this, this, let me tell you how, the, a little bit about the Bay mm -hmm. from the early days. So when I started rapping, we used to make these homemade tapes. I had a rap partner named Freddie B. Mm -hmm. Freddie B knew people all over Oakland. He was from West Oakland. He lived in East Oakland. He mm -hmm. had did some time as a juvenile, and he just was kind of connected to all these guys. So that's how we got the music out there. Mm -hmm. And when we were rapping, this would have been like, we were selling tapes in the streets of Oakland like 1981, 82, mm -hmm. 83, 84. Really popular. Mm -hmm. And in the early days of me and Freddie B, I'm, I'm telling you, there was, we were the only rappers. It was like, it was like, I don't, I, I don't care from San Francisco to mm -hmm. anywhere you stretch in the entire Bay Area. We were the rappers. Right. That was it. And we, from day one, we represented Bay Area rap. We like talked about the streets of Oakland. We we didn't really mimic other. We we just did mm -hmm. what we, we did. it came from our, our soil. So uh, later on, when we got in the studio, the formula was to um, was to try to make songs. Because the East Coast was deep into James Brown. I mm -hmm. love the funk. I right. love James Brown. I love it all. But the East Coast was like, it had been done. They was like all up in it, mm -hmm. just sampling everything James Brown. So I'm like, we got to do the funk, so let's do George Clinton. I, at the same time, without even talking or even being in touch, guys like Dr. Dre mm -hmm. and, you know, the NWA, they were doing yeah, the, the same thing. Th that Midwest funk was very popular in the Bay. So And the California. So basically, we started to sound. And it's like, we're just mimicking records like, uh, you know, Dr. Funkenstein by Parliament Funkadelic. Just mm -hmm. funky, slow bass lines. Just trying to get some identity. And later, after we've laid the foundation, mm -hmm. you got Two Short E-40, a whole wave of groups, the R&B groups like In Vogue and Tony, mm -hmm. Tony, Tony. Like, stuff is coming out of the bay that's going really big. Digital Underground, mm -hmm. MC Hammer, it's big. Yeah. 
and somewhere in there you got all this foundation mm -hmm. of and we all the, everybody i just named also has a previous bay area music foundation of tower of power and sly and the family right. stone and pointed like, sisters right. and, I mean, Cali Funk. you know just just groups from the mm -hmm. bay yeah and i think when the next generation came after us the hyphy the hyphy kids mm -hmm. They just pretty much took, you know, MC Hammer was dancing. Mm -hmm. You know, people in, in the Bay, they dance in the streets. They dance in the, in the we really dance in the club. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, people standing around like club yeah, posing. Yeah. Like, they dance in the Bay. Right. And I just think they took it and made it into, they took that funk that we made, that we made sped it up a little bit, made it a little more fun. You had artists like Mac Dre. Shout out to Mac the time, Dre. Kick the Sneak. Yeah, shout and out to Kick the Sneak. They, they took that, that street thing we were doing and put it in the club. They, they put a little MC Hammer with the thug, you know, just, right. it's just the bass spirit to have a good time with it. So, Feeling myself. So um, I noticed that um, something was brewing because the, the hyphy was really, to me, if you had to, if you had to like, seriously analyze it, it was born out of the city of Oakland and the Bay in general telling the people under 21, you can't stand here on Friday night. You mm. can't loiter there on Saturday night. You can't be there. You can't do this. You can't do that. Like I remember being of, of age going to the club and being downtown Oakland and seeing like 400 youngsters nowhere to go. And right. they just being a nuisance and they right. just walking the streets of downtown and you know, just not necessarily doing crime but it was like a rowdy little bunch right and eventually at some point i just feel like they said you know what we're finna stop walking up to all these little buildings getting turned away and nowhere to go and they mm -hmm. just took the they just walk out into an intersection you know it's popular now yeah just walk out into an intersection and have a party Living right life. and then the cops pull up it's like well how are you gonna tell a thousand kids to move mm -hmm. and they just have a party at the That's intersection a and it, it was like a text message to go out or word of mouth and and it just, it was the hyphy movement. It was not, movement. it didn't come from a studio. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. didn't come from, you know, a, a dance move. Mm -hmm. It came from the streets. So everything that came right. out of it, dancing and music, it, it started in the streets. So it was like, it was organic from the start. But then I, I hear later on mm -hmm. when it became a thing, like you wanted to follow in the footsteps of crunk or mm -hmm. movements, when movements start. And they go, oh, the crunk movement, mm -hmm. oh, the hyphy movement but it, it had a lot of bad stuff to it. Well, it's interesting that I never heard that it broken down from like a socioeconomic thing and it's like yeah. it's almost social justice piece. It makes me think of Oscar Grant. Yeah. Because his situation, or at least if if the film is accurate, mm -hmm. like they was it was New Year's, they was just trying to party and it's like somebody just on in the in the in the in the, in, on the on the BART. Right? Somebody just turned on the radio and everybody just, it's like a party right there. And the one individual cop, he couldn't handle it. Yeah. He couldn't handle it. Yeah, so that was like, that sort of politicized that, that movement, huh? Yeah, um, a lot of little instances happened like that, but that wouldn't happen on camera. You know, That's we, the one we, we, saw. We, need we that, saw that. We need that motivation. We don't need to lose that brother, but mm -hmm. sometimes you need that motivation to, to, for right. people to pay attention. Yeah. Now, speaking of movements, mm -hmm. um, you know, you retired a, a few times. You got 20 albums, but of you never course. really retired, right? Retirement is a, um, it's, with me, it's like a vacation. Okay, so, I'm just no, chilling for a second. A it's a, it's a negotiation hiatus. tactic. I, okay, I get that, I get that. Now, when you, on that first retirement, mm -hmm. when you did the, the album number 10. Yeah, that was. Right, you was already living, you had already relocated to Atlanta by the time you worked on that album, right? right. But then after the retirement and everybody was like so sad to see Short go, it's like you came back out with Little John, and you was an integral uh, part of the crunk movement. It was almost like a new career. Yeah, it was Honestly. like a second win. I, I was, and when I, came, when I came back from that retirement, then I was making songs with Biggie. Mm -hmm. I was in, I was with the Def Squad. You know, Eric mm -hmm. Sermon making make big records, mm -hmm. and you know, just just on a roll, man, in the studio with Jay Z, and kind of, right. you know, working with a, who, you name it. I, I got you, down you, with for everybody. a while, yeah. for a while, and it um. The Little John factor of it kind of, it was, it sort of like Little John, I'm gonna tell you, mm -hmm. Little John was kind of stuck at a moment mm -hmm. in some contractual stuff. So, mm -hmm. long story short, we, we handled that and we built this friendship to where, you know, I helped him get over a certain hump. And I was like, bro, all I want is some beats. That's right. all I want. And we kind of helped each other. He gave me a new career. And I helped him get a, a career, you know, get his career started. Right. So a whole another demographic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he taught me this thing about like the, the dance floor. Like literally, Lil John was a DJ. 
Yes. That a really reggae DJ a, at first. He was a good DJ yeah. from what I first saw. He was yeah. really good at and he's, making he's the back room. in that space now. Yeah. Like the DJ space so, is doing well. But you can see that he was a that he could be a DJ now because he was just like a super hype man. He was like DJ Khaled back in the days. Mm -hmm. Like he so had as an artist, he used to do something that I haven't seen a lot of artists do. He would immediately take a record off the press, like out the studio, and rush to to his network. Mm -hmm. uh, like DJs and homies and get that shit going immediately. Dang. Like immediately. Mm -hmm. Like he would before the label, anybody, Little John would have his own shit popping. Mm -hmm. So what he did to me was he took me, we made these songs, and he took me to the club. He like, meet me at such and such club. Was most, the 559 was the first one we did it mm -hmm. at. And he would, um, and he just, he was just like, you know, just, just kick back. That's I, real organic. And I knew kind of what he wanted me to see. He wanted me to see how the records we made together were reacting in Atlanta. And sure enough, when he came on, crowd went crazy. And Lil John has these phases in his record where, like, you know, it goes to the, the, the energetic part and then, you know what I'm saying, turn up part. And when that part came on the song, the crowd just, like, started doing backflips. And he was, you know, I just, I just got a whole new vision of what I could be mm -hmm. with this guy. I'm like, we got to stay on that dance floor now. So right. before that, I was just all about street shit, mm -hmm. slow tempos, talking shit. It was all about the bass and the, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the shock value, you know? Right, the Freaky Tales. Yeah, that type. Yeah, Freaky Tales is... For people who don't know, that's like a, a OG West Coast classic. Like, that record is so important. I was a real player my whole life, man. Like, we were the guys who came to the club, always at the club. Didn't really care about going in the club. I would, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't. Who cares? We'd be the dudes with the, yeah. with the, you know, everybody got a hundred thousand dollar car or something. Uh -huh. Fly outside. We just don't go inside. We we mess with the ladies on the way in and on the right. way out. And we just we actually have a party in the parking lot. And, and that was, I'm from those guys, you right, know. Right, parking like, lot pimping. Yeah, like really like the, sh the, the, the dudes, man, you know, like the music yeah. bumping out the car. Yeah. And that, I, I even that, feel like. That, uh what is it called? Dang it. Parking lot pimping what? Yeah, but it's called, it's a specific word that we use. For what? And I, for after the club or whatever, and I just cannot think of I it right now. I used to call now. it the blowout, but I don't know what you call it. No, it was, I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm so only going up to the club for the blowout. <laughs> the blowout. The let out. The let out? The okay. let out. Okay. Like close, in, in close, Tallahassee, close, yes, right? like in the moon. If you couldn't get in the moon, you would just go to the parking lot and it would just be bumping. Yeah, that's that parking lot pimping. Well, somebody told me something recently in Oakland. They're like, man, if one of these little dudes with the big rims on his car and the loud stereo, if he plays a certain song mm -hmm. around and just drive around the city and keep playing that song over and over again, and just his car is so clean, everybody thinks he's so cool, his stereo is so loud, if he plays that song over and over again in the city, everybody going to like it oh, yeah. the next day. Like, he's, he's marketing. Marketing. That's marketing. And ain't nobody mm -hmm. paying him. He's going on strictly what he really loves. Right. And it just, that's how songs Street get level out. marketing. It's funny how you talk about uh, you are a clubber, because I met you when you were buying a club outfit and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at New York Speed. How you know it was a club outfit? Because <laughs> you said you were going to a party, and I didn't recognize who you were at first. Okay. And you were like, you were going to a party. I was like, oh, what party are you going to? And you probably said <laughs> I was a groupie or something. <laughs> and then someone else was like, oh, my God, too short. Can I take a picture? And I was like, oh, shit, it's too right. short. Yeah, I, I will buy some clothes and put them on in the store I bought and go straight to the party. Yep. I'll, I'll do that. Great commission, thank you. Now, <laughs> Little John produced Blow the Whistle. A lot of people don't know that. Yes, he did. Yeah, and that record, when it came out, it was the hugest thing. Uh, Jay-Z used that record to woo LeBron when mm -hmm. he jumped on and did his own version he of it. He was defending LeBron. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I DJ a little bit now. Right. I don't do a party without playing that record. And I'm sure there's a lot of DJs. It don't, see, I DJ, I, I, my crowd is like a more pure hip-hop crowd, mm -hmm. but they gonna be like, bitch, when that record come on. It don't matter it's, what crowd. It's something about timeless music. Mm -hmm. You can't put your finger on it in the studio. You can't make it if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. But when, it, when those ingredients fit right, it, a certain song just lasts forever. I, yeah. I, we, the best producers can't tell you what that is. Mm -hmm. You would, you would sit there and be a, a genius and love this song mm. and this other one that she just was okay. It'd be the one that right. is, is your signature. Was that was it like that? You you didn't expect Blow the Whistle to be like that. Okay, I um definitely didn't expect it to last. Yeah, cause it's when it came off the off, off the speakers, it sounded really good. Mm -hmm. Little John, every now and then, Little John would come to you and he would say, "Listen to these beats." Other times he'll come to you and say. I don't want you to hear nothing I ever made before. Let's, let's make the song right now in the studio. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of producers abandon that craft. That's how yeah. it always was at first. Every time when I was a youngster, we went to the studio, we always went in the studio with nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and you're we, a producer too. I make beats, I do yeah. everything, but yeah. I, don't, 
I made the beats when I didn't have producers. <laughs> right, 808 style. Before the luxury of, of paying people. Right. Then when I was like, oh, you know how to make beats here. Right, right, right. <laughs> so I was, when I had nothing but a drum machine and a keyboard, And you were a drummer beats. in high school, right? Yep, I, I mean, I can make beats right now, I just, mm -hmm. you know, it's just the luxuries of life. But, <laughs> Blow the Whistle Lil John came in there and he's like, he's like, man, I want to, because I always, I always knew he had them beats. I'm mm -hmm. like, just what you got? Play from the drum machine, mm -hmm. play a, a CD, play anything, play something with beats. Right. He's like, nah, we gonna this. He's like, tonight we're gonna make a beat. I wanna mm. make a song that sounds like it's an old two short song. Mm. Now, mind you, this is 2005 when we made it, but he's still like, I want, it, I want it to sound like some old two short. Mm -hmm. So that was the goal. It, the goal was not, oh, we're gonna make a club banger. He just wanted to make a, a record that really sounded like old, the old funk. That's two short. why it don't sound like Little John. So he, he did that, and at the time, Lil John was just in the middle of his love of crunk rock. Mm -hmm. So on Blow the Whistle, he came in, he put a lot of sounds. It was it was really noisy, and it was um, but it was good noise because mm -hmm. Lil John he had these this way of like doing sound effects kind mm -hmm. of sounds, like sort of like a whistle or something. Right. And it wasn't really like a musical note, but it would fill up the beat, like whistles and stuff. <laughs> right, like, right. And um, and he put rock guitar on it. And I never, I cannot, I cannot fucking find that version for the life of me. I looked every fucking, every fucking hard drive, everything. Every time I pull it up, it's the version that everybody got. I right. So, we literally had like a little little showdown. We had, we had many many showdowns. Mm -hmm. uh, Shake that monkey was a showdown. Right. I, I rapped a whole different song, Ugh. and Lil John was like, "Bro, that is not what that song is for." <laughs> like he like. <laughs> Erase all that, and right. then he went in there and did the Shake That Monkey Think hook. Like and then that. I went home and did my homework and came yeah. back. But, but Blow the Whistle, um, we did a mix. Like, the mix you know now is the mix we did. But right. it had all these extra sounds. So I argued with him. I was like, man, we should do this and that. He's like, man, this is dope. Mm -hmm. And then when he wasn't around, I pulled the session up, and I was like, uh, mute, mute, <laughs> mute, 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 mute. The most fun part of that record in the party mm -hmm. is what's my favorite word. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, what's so powerful about the word bitch? All right, look. The song, the uh -huh. entire song is numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't know something about, I don't know if that's the beauty of it, mm -hmm. the simplicity of the beat, but then the whole rap is numbers. It's just numbers. I keep saying, like, the, the, the first verse, it's all mathematical equations. Like I'm, I'm, I'm equating hours and stuff. And mm -hmm. and if you just listen to it, mm -hmm. go back and listen to it. And it's it's kind of um. I don't know. I think we got this real simple magic on that one. Mm -hmm. It's it's just like ABCs or something. It's mm -hmm. real simple. And the bitch part is fun because mm -hmm. all these years before that song came out, you've been hearing too short yell out bitch. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's very derogatory. Other mm -hmm. times it might make you laugh. Snoop Dogg turned it into B.I.s. Right. And Death Row had fun with it and everybody, you know, it, it became pop culture. Right. And then it, on Blow the Whistle, I was literally like the shit had gotten out of hand. Like, Ask Dave Chappelle. Like, yeah, I'm like, this is my, my bitch. Right. And now the whole world is like <laughs> sticking their dick in my bitch. And I'm like, I got to bring this bitch, I got to bring it back home. So, right. so I, had, I had heard an argument. I was not involved in the argument, but the argument was somebody who knew said, no, nah, Too Short came with the word bitch. And somebody was like, fuck, no, nah, that's Snoop Dogg shit. And mm -hmm. they was arguing it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I gotta like, like, like right. cement this shit right. and kind of just make it mine. Right. And that was, bl Blow the Whistle was that punch. But you go back and listen to it, it's a lot of sports metaphors. It's a lot of, it's just really about um, fucking up in life. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, the Blow the Whistle, the whole, the whole theme is like, like sports, like you fucking right. up, you foul. Fucking, uh, you know, right? penalty and shit, throw the flag, blow right. the whistle. Now we're in an era now where, mm -hmm. the, the woke era, mm -hmm. the Me Too era, where people are pushing back specifically on artists like we're yourself. We all woke and sleep at the same time right now. I agree with that. Popularly woke and sleep. I agree with that. But how do you feel about the fact that people will be woke, right? Mm -hmm. And be like, don't use uh, slurs, gendered men. slurs mm -hmm. like bitch, but then we'll go to the club and dance to your record to yell that out. Yeah, I, I never understood why a, you know, a young lady, a beautiful woman would, you know, of all races would spend eight, 10 years getting a master's degree, become a successful lawyer, and hear a two short song and start twerking in the club. I, know why. <laughs> I have no idea why that is accepted. Right. I just, I think we just, I, I found this space mm -hmm. where I share it with, 
You know, I've, I've gotten um, free legal services mm -hmm. from a lawyer who didn't want to fuck me or nothing. She was just like, mm -hmm. I love, and it wasn't even blow. It was just like, I love this song you made called uh, Sophisticated. Right. Where in the song, I mentioned like a lawyer who's like a baller. And right. she's like, I love that song. Shot me some like discounted services. Right. <laughs> well, I feel like you're speaking the language of the people. You're speaking, mm -hmm. you know, a pro proletarian language. You're speaking in the, in the, that's what's beautiful about hip hop is that even if it's offensive to you, Mm -hmm. It represents the ugly and the beauty of our society. If it's not fun, it's funny. Mm -hmm. If it's not fun or funny, it's, it's very fucking appropriate for you to step outside of yourself, become too short, because too short is an alter ego for me too. Right. And call somebody a bitch. Right, right. Todd like, is a different dude. You know what I'm saying? Like you yelling bitch, like he ain't talking about me, he's talking about her. Like mm -hmm. you, it, it, it puts you in a place where, where you, um, you can kind of desensitize it, because I, I make it fun. Right. On purpose. I, I don't have a lot of songs. I'm just like, you fucking bitch, fuck you, bitch. Right. I, I don't take that approach as a writer. Right. But that I, becomes, it's that whole line between this is entertainment, mm -hmm. this is fun, in the same way that Quentin Tarantino is not going to call someone a nigger and shoot somebody, or mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese right, right, is right. not a real gangster. Like, this is entertainment, right? Um, you did a thing with, um, I don't remember the website, where it was to me, and just from my perspective, it was like supposed to be some funny shit mm -hmm. where you're teaching, you're giving little kids sex advice. Now, it got taken in a different way. It wasn't even that. It was, a, it was totally taken a different mm -hmm. way. It was, um, it was a whole spread from mm -hmm. XXL magazine. Mm -hmm. And it was about my new album that came out. That, they, they scrapped that. Mm -hmm. And at the end of a whole day hanging out at XXL, like we were probably up there an hour and a half or something, two hours, mm -hmm. just kicking it with the staff, doing little stuff. The guy said, we got this little thing we do online. Mm -hmm. At the time, online wasn't even like right. the, 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 the shit shit. And he was like, we got this thing we do online. Like, what is he's like, he's like, we just want you to give advice to your younger self. Uh. So oh, okay. I never, that was my- So it's to your younger self. I've had mm. um, about three or four good social media fuck ups before I learned mm -hmm. This is not, you know, even though you're not, me personally, I'm not on Twitter and Instagram all day, mm -hmm. you are. That's what I was trying to get to. You're not that. above going viral. So what I did right. was I, I could come back on, at that moment rehearsed and go, I tell my younger self, you know, save more money and, right. and, you, know, and you know, don't sign bullshit cards, just some, some shit like that. But I was like, you know what? You're going to be a player when you grow up. That's what I was telling my young self. Right. And it went on to give myself some advice how to be a, and then dude fucking, he, he, it was Friday when I did it. Mm -hmm. Everybody at BT, fuck, I mean, at a XXL, XXL. Mm -hmm. ran for cover and said, I didn't do it. It posted on Saturday. Right. And they, was, they said they blamed it on the guy who got me to say it. Right. They said he went on his own, put it up there. So the, the lady who was running it, everybody, they was like, too short did this shit. And, and it, like, they never, ever once, like, I, I got on the phone with Dream Hampton for a long conversation, and she explained to me something that, stuck with me since that day. Mm -hmm. And she just gave me the version of young girls who had been subjected to, you know, mm -hmm. little boy male chauvinistic yeah, stuff, absolutely. such as grabbing your top at the pool or grabbing your butt and running mm -hmm. or just all this little stuff Go or or, or or going to tell your homeboy, smell mm -hmm. my finger and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. All know? that stuff that we taught is normal yeah, as they, young men. They, she said, you have no idea on that day these little girls went home with a certain humiliation or a certain hurt. Mm -hmm. And you didn't know that. You were celebrating her top coming down. Mm -hmm. You had no idea that you did it in front of 100 people at the pool. Mm -hmm. So I got a new perspective on just, it was, it was, it was to me like training in like social media and just in, in being insensitive towards certain things and subjects that I had been rapping about, mm -hmm. kind of pimp mentality, whatever, but not really realizing all the layers of it. Right. So, you know, social media got me a few times in that aspect, but since then, I've, as a grown ass man, I've learned the power of just when to say words, certain words. Mm -hmm. Context and, and, is everything. Exactly, and and without social media, it didn't have that same ramification. You know, like a fight outside outside a club wasn't immortalized. Mm -hmm. Right, you could do that shit. Pop some shots in the air, go, and then word of mouth said it was, but not camera didn't say it was. You know. Right. I bring that yeah. up because I, I saw your I saw you take ownership and grow in that moment, mm -hmm. and that's what we have to do as men, I mm -hmm. think. And you said something later after that when you were asked, I think by TMZ, or mm -hmm. I, I could be getting that wrong, about the Me Too movement. And you said the art of trying to fuck is over. The days of trying to fuck is over. Essentially that Tr we have- Trying to Trying fuck, to fuck, yeah. that's important. Yeah. We have to let, let the women choose us. Mm -hmm. When you said that, 
I was like, man, that's some that's some wisdom right there. Cause it was it was a certain art to it. All these men had their way to, of getting it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Boys some of it was boys. some of it as we know now was really foul, but mm -hmm. other guys had very charming ways of getting it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think um, I mean we we evolve as humans. Yeah. And I I have been a rapper who forever has tried to get a female rapper. I was like, be like me, talk mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And then we started getting little Kims and Foxys, right, and right. you know certain elements of you you see what Lil Kim and Foxy gave birth to is right, now they gave birth to now, now Cardi, Cardi and yeah. Megan Thee Stallion, Megan Stallion. You but then know, you also Nikki. have you also have different powerful female MCs Rhapsody. that type of flavor yeah. and I just you know I'm like empower all that shit so I love what Jermaine said the other day mm -hmm. is I kind of get what he was trying to say yeah, but yeah. at the same time I, I love the female the fact that female rappers right now are coming out that I feel like female rappers are emerging mm -hmm. at a faster pace than male rappers right now. I agree. I, at, that we like. I agree. We never like so many female rappers in hip hop ever. We only like one or two at a time right. forever. Right. And now we accept, you know, a whole group of them and they dope artists too. So I'm like, man, get your money. This is hip hop. If you, uh, I mean, I don't like certain parts of hip hop mm -hmm. and I, I, I got a pet peeve with, the way certain guys do interviews. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I know you couldn't get to where you at without being a smart motherfucker. Why are you, right. pretending, Why are you pretending in your interview? And it's dumb. like, they sell an image. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, to me, I'm like, you don't always got to do that. Mm. You could be a character like Too Short, and then when somebody asks you a question, you can answer it intelligently. That's right. You don't have to be your character when you're walking through your regular life. So I, I, I just realized, I'm like, bro, speak up, man. <laughs> That's all yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say it, man, because they're going to quote you when you read that shit back. That, right. Those words you say all stupid right. on purpose, it sounds it's, it look bad when you read it back. Right, you get a bad read back. Speaking, <laughs> of, uh, speaking about the industry, are there things that you are now going to take a stand on that you are raising a daughter or things that you would go back and do differently now that you're raising a daughter and you're going to have to understand a little bit more of how... It's just karma. It's all karma. I believe in karma. I, just, I believe that... Uh, I owe that to the game. Like that's what, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, li right. like literally, like that's how I feel. Like I'm like you have to full circle this thing you did. Mm -hmm. So right, so. and I do think our responsibility as men, living with women in society, it can't be. I'm gonna be, more in touch with women's issues because I have a daughter. Right. Because that can't that can't be the excuse. It has to be from from inside of yourself. Oh, you I know? agree. Yeah, I I think, but I but I do. But as someone who has a daughter, and as someone who has a daughter who's who's over twenty mm -hmm. and lives on her own and is rapping and does shit on Instagram that I'm look look sometimes and I'm like, <laughs> you ain't at that point yet. I got karma too. I don't. I haven't made the records you made, but I got my karma. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like like I, I sometimes I look at my daughter's Instagram. I'm like. I wouldn't do that, but she's not doing anything. Like I, I have to also let her be her own uh -huh, let her woman. Go. You know hey. what I'm saying? Like, like I can't judge her differently than I judged 20 year olds when I was 20. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Um, my first record that I ever heard from you, uh, you were signed to Jive, mm -hmm. and my, I growing up in Brooklyn, I had no idea what Oakland was. All I knew about Oakland was that the Panthers was from there mm -hmm. and it's in the Bay, wherever that's at. Yep. Uh, you came out <laughs> with the Ghetto, mm -hmm. and that video you got a, that video got a lot of run. It's, uh, MTV and BT. It, it's Oakland. It's just, it just is Oakland. It's Oakland. I hadn't heard Freaky Tales. Freaky Tales hadn't made it to right. where I was at yet. I was on the ground. Right. So, in my mind, Too Short was a conscious rapper. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like my first half it, and half. That's right. And, but and I learned, you helped me to learn balance. You helped, you helped me to understand that you could be on one, one record like The Ghetto and the next record like Bitch, and you could be the same. Have those. So, so when you talk to, um, and I know we all in our era got chances to have a, some words with Mr. Farrakhan. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And he, he would take the time and give you some knowledge mm -hmm. and answer some questions and, and offer some information that you didn't have about everything. Mm -hmm. And I asked him about how he personally felt about my type of rap. Right. And he knew about my good songs and my bad songs. Right. He said... He's very in touch with hip hop. Farrakhan. He said, if that's what you want to do, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Because mm -hmm. right. he said, because if you... He was a Calypso He fan. said, if you, if you spit place. knowledge mm -hmm. and it takes you some, to say some ignorant shit to get somebody to learn that knowledge, you're supposed to do that because the person that you're teaching might not be the person you teach him, might not be the person he teaches. Mm -hmm. You still got to teach him. Yeah, it makes Feel sense because, you know, the Nation of Islam uh, was working in the streets, in the jails. They were working with people who didn't have 
access to education, resources, everything. So they had to like speak the language of the streets mm -hmm. to reach them brothers. Absolutely. It turned me so on to a lot of books that, you know, sent me in a different direction that right when I was in my young 30s and, mm -hmm. you know, just, just wisdom, man, that, I, that you know, I, I feel like a, my journey has got mm -hmm. me my longevity, seriously, because I wouldn't have moved to Atlanta, wouldn't be where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Just certain things, make, moves happens. you make. Now, when you were 30, you recorded with Notorious B.I.G. Mm -hmm. um, the World is Filled. You did a couple records with him, but The World is Filled is the, was the first one? And it's, it's probably the most classic. That's one the too. one, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the, like your monologue at the end, Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I was in a moment that day, man. Mm -hmm. I was in a situation. Okay. And I'm sure you've been in these situations. You, you was you, talking to a specific nigga. You a, you a pit bull. Mm -hmm. So you've been in a situation where these rappers, you're going to do a collaboration song. Mm -hmm. And somehow you second to last or you last. And motherfuckers have done their damn thing. Mm. You, you've been in a situation, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so, you back and clean up. So as an MC at this moment, like it's it's just it's just everybody's in the room oblivious to your thoughts, mm -hmm. and you like fuck. Everybody's gas this track, and it's my turn. I know I'm gonna get it. I know, but you like I got it. Like you can't go in there mumble. You, like it's the moment. Mm -hmm. Everything is the strongest. So I here I am in the studio. When we get there, uh, Puffy had already recorded his verse. He mm -hmm. probably had a coach or something. Somebody wrote it. Somebody wrote it. Ah, through it because right. he got the but first Puffy's verse. Puffy's very good at rapping. And this, this, this Don't was, worry about right, this no, was when right he, checks. Right he didn't have a lot of experience back then, though. Right. No, that, that, this was big, this was big second album. Yeah, he, like, Puff didn't have a verse on Puff the first was album. Puff green, he was green. Yeah, this was like. So look, so he was so proud. Carl, right. Carl Thomas did the hook, right. the beat was dope. So Puff. Shout out to Carl Thomas, my oh, smoking man. partner. <laughs> Puff hit play, because uh -huh. he wanted everybody to hear his verse. He like, right. and they like, oh, Make you, it you, hot. Know, you know, you hot, yeah. Right. So that's it. So now Biggie do the thing where he don't touch no pen or paper. Mm -hmm. Before all the rappers was doing that, mm -hmm. only motherfuckers I knew that did that was Jay-Z and Big. Like and, Big and they would sit there, and then to, if I had to describe it, I think they're writing like there's a, ink, there's a pen and paper inside right. your forehead. Because mm -hmm. right. you're writing it, right. but you're memorizing it. So, right. so it ain't a freestyle. It's a vibe. So Biggie does this shit. I'm over there. I ain't wrote shit. We, it, they drinking. They smoking. It's, mm -hmm. Everybody laughing this shit. Right, right. And Big goes in there and says, I'm going to do this shit in one take. And he goes, when the Remy's in my system, ain't no telling. And he fucks up. Mm -hmm. And he goes, no, no, watch, watch this, watch this. <laughs> and the next take, he just run that shit. Right. And everybody's in the studio going, ooh. Like, right. And now it's only one verse left. <laughs> <laughs> so I got my one homeboy with me, my boy uh -huh. P. And I'm sitting there like blank paper. Dang. The whole, I, I, we gotta leave with a song. And now you know how Puff work. Puff like, right. <laughs> Puff like a general in the studio. Right. Like, we gonna make something hot. Right. A, a motherfucker is gonna hang out the window or something. Like he's, right. he's serious. So I'm like, I asked my boy, I said, what you think I should do? He said, now go listen to the song. He said, the hook says, the world is filled with pimps and hoes. Mm -hmm. I just tell you about those I know. Mm. He said, neither one of them rapped about pimps or hoes. Mm. He was like, just rap about, the, do what, he said, do what the hook says. Right. So I say, I thought it was a real life story of some pimps and hoes that I know. And I kind of brought the song home and made the hook in the song kind of makes sense. And in the end, I'm telling you a story. Like, the people who I talked about kind of got mad at me in real life. But <laughs> <laughs> you, was, you was talking from the heart. Yeah, but, but I didn't say no names. And right. that just Only was they a story. knew the story. They should feel honored. But that's the genius of Puff and, and Big in that moment is that, you know, again, Puff had you in there because he understood what Too Short represented. Mm -hmm. New York didn't know what Too Short represented. You know, when, when, when Big was talking about uh, not from Houston but a rap a lot, only real hip hop cats understood what rap right, a lot right, was. Right. When he had you on the album, niggas in New York was not rocking with Too Short, but Puff understood. And he knew that it, whether or not him and Big was going to talk about what the hook was on, Too Short was going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm exactly. saying? Exactly. And, and Big, t he always told me, man, from the day I met him, when I met him, I didn't even know he was Big. I, I met him, he just, he met me with a simple, um, he was like, yo, he called me over to, to the limo. It was at the mm -hmm. Outcast picnic. Outcast used to throw a big ass picnic in Atlanta every mm -hmm. year. And he called me over to the limo and he was like, something like, yo, yo, kid, yo, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, fuck with you. Something like that. Right, right, right. He didn't even yeah. say, what's up, I'm big. Right, man. He right, just right. said, I'm like, okay, what's up? Laughing at that. So later on, when he blew the fuck up, we was on the tour bus one day mm -hmm. smoking. Uh -huh. And he's like, you remember that time with the limo? He's like, that was me. And I'm like, oh, shit, I remember okay. that shit. So, Word up. I mean, him and Jay, they was like, man, he was like, I swear, both of them kind of told me, it was like, man, this probably was 10 motherfuckers bumping y'all in New yeah. York, and we was one of That's them. real. <laughs> the, 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 the street niggas was bumping too short. Like, the niggas who was rapping, but also had a foot in the street life, fucking with the gangsters. They was fucking with Houston music. They was fucking with too short. 
You know what I'm saying? Certain shit. Yeah. It, Puff it, when Puff was trying to do Snoop and Dre, he was trying to do a New York version of okay. he, uh, of Snoop and Dre with the with the samples and you know he was inspired and, and, by and that. gangster shit. Yeah. It, it's all good, you know, because I mean it, it in hip hop you have to have a uh, you know elements like I had to have certain things of that I I listened to in New York and like like I, my my whole shit the, mm -hmm. the 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 foundation of Too Short is Spoony G mm -hmm. mixed with Melly Mel. And I'm just kind of like, right. that's that, that's who I only gravitate to. I'm like, when I'm right. writing, I'm like, how would you know? Melly Mel is, is very, he gives you a visual, you see it. The ghetto, I've heard you describe the ghetto as the Oakland version of the message. Yeah, I which mean. Which Melly Mel wrote. Man, Melly Mel, just, the message changed my life. Right, and then like, Puff went on to sample the message was, later. I was, a, I was a rapper about two years playing mm -hmm. around on the mic before the message, just, just messing around. Mm -hmm. And it was all fun and games and little rhymes and shit. And the message came out. And I was walking down the street with a boom box mm -hmm. by myself when the shit came out on the radio. Like broken glass everywhere. I literally, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I stopped in my mm. tracks and listened by myself on the streets and listened <laughs> to this whole damn song going. For the first time ever, I heard so many New York rap records in the party mm -hmm. and this shit say ho. That's the first time I ever could see New York. Mm. I saw, I'm like, damn. And I just, mm. it was, it took two seconds. I was like, mm. I'm about to start rapping about Oakland. That's, that's, that's <laughs> what I said to myself. Do you remember the video for the message? A little bit. It was, it showed that the Bronx was it, like, they had slum, slum lords burning the buildings down. If you watch the video for the message, it's Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel and them. They walking around the dilapidated, fucked up, broke down the Bronx. Crumbled buildings yeah, everywhere. I, I, I know. Broken it. glass everywhere. But when I think about the, the video for the ghetto, it's like, you showing that version of Oakland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um. And then Spoonie G was, uh, he was always the slickest motherfucker in the room, That's the coolest right. motherfucker in the room. When he leaves, he leaving with the girl. And, you know, everybody had a persona in rap, and I was like, who do I want to be? And you got you to gotta grab something. So that was, you know, listen to Spoonie G right now. Right. I, I'm going to tell you, I, I took a lot of what he did. Spoonie G used to rap like fucking 100 bar verses. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even think the song had a fucking hook. He just would rap forever. You listen to songs I got, I, I'm like, fuck the hook. I started rapping right. In, right in the beginning of the song and right. rap seven minutes to the end. Just fuck it. And y'all had, for y'all to be listening to Spoonie G in Oakland, those tapes traveled far. Yeah, man. And um, just, uh, just who passed away, Jimmy Spicer, the Super Rest Rhymes. Rest in peace to Jimmy Spicer. Super Rhymes. Was, Super Rhymes. It was the biggest shit when it was out in Oakland. When that, when that was out, that was yeah. the biggest record in Oakland. Right. Like, we took to it immediately. Um, talk to me about your relationship with Pimp C. Pimp C, I can only say, it was like my little brother, like if we had the same mom and daddy. That's, mm -hmm. That was my little brother. That was the guy who, you know, I motivated him to be who he was. And at every point in the game, like he looked up to me and he wanted to run with me and around mm -hmm. me. And at every point- He talked the, about you a lot. Yeah, every point in the game, he would never let me even flinch mm -hmm. on not being like short dog the boss. Mm -hmm. Like he like, fuck that shit. Like, he, like don't say nothing bad about me. Don't say nothing bad about my son. Any, like anything, he would just get Mm -hmm. And then he would also be at me like, like, man, you show dog, man. Like, you know, like, <laughs> like bro, get up that monkey shit. Like, cause you know me, I, I, I play the humble. Right. I walk in a room and wouldn't tell nobody about no too short shit. I just, right. whatever. Hey, what's your name? I'm Todd. How you doing? And let's let it flow till you figure it out. See, wasn't like that. <laughs> he was like, you gonna know who the fuck we are. Like, you, That's gonna, right. you gonna respect this pimp. <laughs> That's right. But no, um, we had a lot of adventures, man. That was my guy. I, um, I remember, um, you know, a lot of years of them being like him and Bun B, being my little homies, we on tour, ain't no doubt about it. You know, the lineup, you mm -hmm. know, they gonna be opening the show and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be a good ass show. And I just remember um, one day, I'm gonna say it was St. Louis. I just mm -hmm. remember it was an outdoor show. And UGK had to go on right before me. And I do my thing. Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck. We down south where you put me on the stage, I'm gonna do the damn thing. Mm -hmm. But these motherfuckers did some shit that day mm. that, that you like big bro, see little bro. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I go on there, they do this shit and they just rip the crowd. And I go on there, I do my thing. And I said after the show, I said from now on, when we like deep down south, I'm, I'm not going on uh, <laughs> after y'all. Y'all going on after <laughs> me. Like we, we got to that relationship. I, I had the same relationship with Scarface. Shout to the to point Scarface. where we on a show. Mm -hmm. And it's, the promoter has a schedule. And it says, too short, 8 o'clock, Scarface, 8.45. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm sitting there in my dressing room getting ready to go on like 750, mm -hmm. and this nigga's on stage rapping. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you think I was going to go on after you? You crazy. <laughs> so Scarface <laughs> would ignore the schedule. It's just to not go on after me. We, we have the same battle right now. I'm like, Brad, quit fucking playing, bro. Like, go on. Like, they love you, man. You what do you think of his run for uh, city council? Oh, I thought he was going to say his rap run. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't over. He still do shows. I was, I, I was on the phone with, with Brad, and we was talking, you know, about his his, his city council run and, mm -hmm. I, run, and I was so proud of him. And um, I was trying to get him on this show. I'm like, when are you gonna be in LA? He's like, shit, I got a show in Baton Rouge, and I got a show in Alabama, and I got a show. In, and I'm like, wait a second, ain't, ain't you running for city council? He's like, oh, I still gotta go get rap money. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so um, I got a show in Houston on his birthday, so we're gonna we're gonna celebrate after his, after his uh. After the show, but I, I just did a show with Scarface the other day. That's one of my best friends. I, mm -hmm. I just um I think that uh if he was at home and he got a little weight, he's an OG and he mm -hmm. started being concerned about real local politics, which I believe he really is. I believe are the real politics. Me, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, absolutely I, local politics is, is where it's at. So a lot of people weigh heavy on uh, did you vote for president? That's but I'm right. Like, I'm like that ain't really like all That's the right. way. Your community of that's exactly people. right. So and and whoever's the president and you know I'm an anti-Trump guy, right? I, you hear me talking talking shit about Donald Trump all the time, but I also understand that whoever's president, whether it's Trump or Obama, that don't affect the people on the grassroots level. That don't affect you, you people. Can have, you can fight whole different battles. That's right. It's about, about that. local elections on that level. Yep. So that's why it's so good with Scarface and Willie D's doing. Yeah, Willie is very opinionated. I, I, <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't know how Willie, Willie is running for a city council, but also on Instagram, acting up. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing, um, I don't- Shout out to Willie D. I too. don't think we got a lot of positive out of Trump, but the one thing we did got, um, you, you probably, as a politician now, you could you could stop biting your lip and biting your tongue and- uh, and you do it. You can say stuff, you can curse, you can- Yeah. You can be yourself and people like, it, it's a new era in, American politics was like America just likes to feel like it's relatable. I think we talked about this earlier because like if they can be themselves, like okay, well I can be myself and still make it too. And probably the best thing about Trump being in presidency is that people realize that anything is possible. You just got to put your mind to it. You literally can have no experience and still get the job. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I said that. That was to, so nicely put. I said that to uh, you know most uh, Yasin Bey has been trying to convince Dave Chappelle to run for president. What? You know what I'm saying? And if, if Trump could win, Dave Chappelle could definitely win. What? Um, speaking of Scarface on the phone, I said mm -hmm. that to him. I was like, you know, I'm an anti-Trump guy, but you know, if you get any feedback, negative feedback from people not liking your lyrics from Scarface or from Ghetto Boys, point to Trump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Own that shit. Yeah, d Trump doing that shit in real life. You just rapping about the shit. Man. It's crazy. But, but he also made a lot of racists that probably wouldn't have spoke out a lot more comfortable about speaking out. And there are more racists than anything in this. Yeah, country. I mean, but that's the thing. He, Donald Trump is a white supremacist, and he has a white supremacist agenda. And the white supremacists who felt, who were cowering in the Obama era, like maybe I shouldn't say nothing. Mm -hmm. You see them on the news when in 2016, they was on the news saying, he's saying what I'm thinking. Exactly. That's what he, that's what they were saying. Exactly. Yeah, man. Back in the day, like, the Bay Area is known for a lot of things. Known for the Panthers. Did, did you know um, that the Hell's Angels originated? In I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I know about the, those. I don't know how the Panthers and the Hell's Angels. Well, you know, they had that famous. They had that famous concert where the Hell's Angels like killed somebody. Yeah, the the uh, Woodstock some type yeah, of shit. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the Monterey Jazz Festival. Yeah, or some you know that that Sound the Hell's Monterey. Angels reputation changed after that, that situation. But I don't know how you get the Panthers and the Hells Angels from the same city. Like, it's, it's the <laughs> population now right. is under 500,000. Like, it's, how does that happen? But you, you know, you were selling stuff out of your trunk. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the Bay Area was always seen as the forefront of independent hip hop. You, 40, you know, even when okay, High Fiona so came. Okay, so here's, um, I know you saw it. If you didn't see it, you should have saw it. It was uh, Planet Rock, mm -hmm. and that was the documentary. I think VH1 did. It was like a four-part series. I don't mm -hmm. know if it was BT VH1. Mm -hmm. but it was a four-part series, or maybe more. I don't know, but it was about the relationship between crack cocaine and hip-hop. Okay. And it told all these stories, including mine, of how we built these empires off of crack profits. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, in the early days, you know, economically, there was no bank that right. would loan me anything to make music. So 
I started off, the first label I started on was called 75 Girls, mm -hmm. owned by a drug dealer who kind of had rock star aspirations. Mm -hmm. And he dressed like a rock star, and he hung around, you know, famous people and people that were local celebrities and people that had been in, you know, big groups and stuff, because I told you we got the musical heritage. Mm -hmm. And I learned from them, you know, the, the, the ropes. Like, they was buying studio time every night, but it was all dope money. Mm -hmm. And then right after that, I, I was in that situation during 1985 and 86. So in 87, the situation fell apart. And the guy who was running the label, his little brother and his first cousin, we all started a label. We took his exact formula. We went to the same studio that we had been going to. We went to the same uh, manufacturer that pressed the shit up. Mm -hmm. We went to the same distributor. And we went to the same record stores dropping shit off. Mm -hmm. We did the same fucking routine. Picked up the checks. We did everything he did. And basically, in between those two situations, 75 Girls, mm -hmm. and the next label we started was called Dangerous Music. Dangerous, right. Um, Shout out to the Dangerous crew. You're, I you're, literally, like you would go to Wall Street trying to raise capital, I mm -hmm. went to the streets, mm -hmm. to my old customers I used to sell tapes to, and tried to raise dope money. Mm -hmm. And I had, like, I had like a little two sheet. Mm -hmm. It told you, if you invest this much, you know, we're gonna make, we're gonna press them up, sell them for right. this, and make that. And dudes was like, Dudes, a lot of money was like, man, I don't, I don't think so, show. I don't think so, mm -hmm. I don't think so. And then one homie tapped in and, and went for it. Mm -hmm. And really, um, above and beyond what I put on paper, really invested in that shit. Wow. And we fucking made millions. Mm. And it's like, at the same exact time, E40 is right up the road, 30 minute drive up the road in Vallejo. And those boys are selling dope. Mm -hmm. And they, him and his brothers and his cousin, Be, Be Legit, Be legit. Shot, right. they, they became a family group and put their dope money in their career. Mm -hmm. And you building empires on this shit. Mm -hmm. Down the road, you got Dr. Dre, who's a genius. DJ, he been in the world class wrecking crew. They on some shit that, mm -hmm. you know, Lonzo and them, Dre mm -hmm. wanna, you know, I don't know, you know, he always wanted something bigger and better. Right. And here come Easy E, little motherfucker that sells a whole lot of so dope. dope. Didn't give a fuck about rapping, but he was yeah. like, Dre, you wanna be, okay, I, I'll put the money up. And literally, in the process of Dre liked the swag so much, we've heard this story a few times. Mm -hmm. Like the non rapper putting up the money, you know, mm -hmm. the cool dude in the hood. Like, you do it. And then all of a sudden right. it works. That's how every marginalized community has started in America. That's the story of America. So, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that that's how we became hip hop. Yeah. It's just literally the way we did it. Like, I, you couldn't be E40 or Too Short without the drug connection. I couldn't figure out how to sell cassette tapes and, and albums. Mm -hmm if I didn't do exactly what drug dealers did when they sold right. dope. I, I did thought. exactly like them. That's how they like, oh, you're selling out the trunk. Where the fuck you think the dope was? Right. It was in the fucking trunk. Like, at the same time, we dropping off boxes of cassettes and shit to record stores and distributors. The same dudes I'm hanging with, we pulling up. This is not a proud story I tell either. Mm. We pulling up in the gas station and they like, window to window. Big ass blocks and shit. Mm. And it just, you know, just, it was, Oakland's wild. It's yeah. wild. It's so funny because it reminds me of T.I. He was telling us about how Atlanta was built up pretty much off of drug money. But at the end of the day. You gotta watch Planet Rock. Everybody's yeah. story's the same. At the end of the day, it's just very commendable because we keep making a way out of nowhere. And it's like, I want to make this music. The bank's not going to help me out. So now I got to figure out another way to do it. And that all goes back to these corporations not wanting to bring black people up. Because if you would just give him a loan from the bank, then we would have to sell drugs to his city in order to make So you look money. at my first favorite hip hop movie was Wild Style. And it's just oh, showing man. you the love of it. Shout out to not, Fab Five Freddy. Not a lot of economics in it except like the, the factor of like ripping it off, you know, mm -hmm. taking it taking it to the, the art gallery or whatever. Taking it downtown, from the Bronx then, to downtown. Then we get Beat Street was kind of the same theme, right. you know, they, they're trying to Spit exploit us Ramos. Shit. But then you get Crush Groove. Mm -hmm. Russell Simmons. And Russell goes and gets money from the dope dealer right. or the lo a loan shark and he builds a fucking empire. Right. And that, that's, that's what we all was on, bro. Like Russell Rush. <laughs> right. That's what we was on. Oh, we was on that shit. Like, go Planet Rock, the, the fucking documentary. It's like, we built this shit on crack. The only thing we didn't do, we fucked up. We didn't buy the fucking neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Right. And then like, it got gentrified. It, it got criminalized, like the war on drugs. Like, they started putting everybody away for, like, okay. the whole crack and the guns yeah, and yeah. shit. But right, there was a window of opportunity at that time. All real estate was cheap as fuck. Mm. Compared to the sound like Brooklyn. profits. Oakland always reminds me of Brooklyn because it's like across the bridge from the big city. 
but it's where all the real niggas is and at. And you got a big reputation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got yeah. big respect. People proud to be from Oakland. And so People the proud early, to be from the early days, I used to come to New York, right? Mm -hmm. Never leave Manhattan. The farthest we might go was Harlem. Right. And, you know, get some, get some culture. Right. And maybe get a haircut or buy some <laughs> weed or something. And then go right back to Manhattan. So we go to these parties, right? And then I can't really tell you who I was specifically with at the time. Mm -hmm. It was like record company reps and shit, mm -hmm. or where they might be from. But then you'd be in the party, and I didn't really know Brooklyn cats then, so it just it would go. It was like right. It, it wasn't on the mic it. either. Somebody would be like Brooklyn, uh -huh. right, right. And then just like the whole party would come to life. We like, right. And then cats would start getting nervous and shit. That, but that's like, <laughs> but that's like, that's like you know, if I'm DJing. Anywhere near the Bay Area, <laughs> and, like and I play that Looney's record. And oh, where yeah. you from? Oakland. I swear it's they the go same crazy. shit. You know, yeah, Oakland sorry. reminds me of uh, people from the Bay remind me of people from the DMV a lot. I think they have a lot of the same swag and a lot of the same style. Yeah, I, I, I feel that DC. I think anywhere where you are forced to right. be in a in a certain area that's not like a lot of square footage, mm -hmm. and you like it's a lot of real motherfuckers right there. Right. Like you, you forced to like. It, it makes you a certain way. Even if you're not a gangster, mm -hmm. you understand, like like social media. It's mm -hmm. like it's almost like don't make that wrong fucking step. <laughs> right, right. Because like literally, like you can't hide from your words and actions in a city like Oakland. You can't hide. If you said, I said, fuck Talib. Mm -hmm. I can't hide. It's, it's going straight to you. That reminds me when I um in 1995, um, I got fired from my job and I was like, fuck it, I'm up. I'm a pursue this rap shit. And I knew Mike Anon for Freestyle Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And he was doing Good Life Cafe shit yep, out in Los that. Angeles, right? So I took a, me and my man Juju took a Greyhound bus to Los Angeles. It's to a go long to, ride, bro. Yeah, three days. <laughs> it's a long oh, ride. Shit. Three days. To, uh, I, I got, we got kicked off the bus. <laughs> of course weed, I did. All that shit, <laughs> right? I went to the Good Life and I met uh, Tom and Corey from Mystic Journeyman. Mm -hmm. And they was like, this Good Life shit's cool. You need to come to the Bay. I hitchhiked to the Bay. Damn. I went to Leopold's, but, but outside of Leopold's, because I wanted to go to Leopold's because Dale the Funky Homo Sapien was working there at the time. Yeah. I ran into King San from the Who Riders. He was like, we down with Hobo Junction. They took me to Saphir Crib. Saphir, yeah. Saphir was beefing with Hyrule at the time. So <laughs> never, all that. I never knew about that. Yeah, way. so all that, like, when you say you in the Bay and somebody say something about you, mm -hmm. I'm an outsider. I, I put myself in the Bay Area, but what I, know, what I notice is that the hustle you talk about, mm -hmm. The, the, you learn from the drug dealers to sell out the back of the trunk. Souls of Mischief, uh, Hobo Junction in them, these was lyrical, miracle, spiritual rap And did you know that in the Bay, we mm -hmm. have an unwritten rule. Mm -hmm. Like it's, even to this day, it's mm -hmm. been from day one to now, nobody in the Bay charges each other to do songs. Ah, oh, wow. That's, that's beautiful. Nice. Like we just do it, you're like, man, let's do one. And we just do it, like, your homies might not like my homies, we still do a song together. That's beautiful. Like, it, I don't know where that came from, it's just a, Courtesy that we just do across the board. I mean, shoot me a verse. I should have. You know, Brooklyn kind of like that too. Like you know, like even when you know got Casanova out with this with the So Brooklyn Challenge, and you know, Brooklyn oh. is represented by Maino Streets in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. represented by Maino, Casanova, Fabulous, and them. Mm -hmm. uh, Uncle Murder. Whenever somebody pop off with something, not Takashi, they left him out. But when, <laughs> <Takashi>? <laughs> put, him, put him to the side. He had incredible <laughs> sponsors at the yeah. time. He, he was had, popping. He had good sponsors. Yeah. You know, but. Those cats have always done records together. I'm not a gangster rapper at, by any means. When I was when I was in my club phase in New York, going to Lotus and all that, mm -hmm. I would party with Mano. Mano would make sure I was good in the clubs. When I run into Uncle Uncle Murder, it's like the big bear hug. <laughs> I met Casanova just recently. You know, I did a show at Brooklyn Bowl. Me and DMX did a show. Mm -hmm. He came because he fuck with DMX, and Casanova. You know, I didn't expect somebody like Casanova to be fucking with a Talib Kweli, but it's Brooklyn. He's a hometown legend, man. It's Brooklyn. Yeah. It's that fraternity, bro. It's yeah. that fraternity. No matter where you at, no matter where you at, I don't give a fuck who you are. Mm -hmm. If you dare tell me you're from Oakland, we we some kind of it's we locked. Right. We favors and every, every it's all everything. We family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we fuck that. So uh, first of all, that's how it should be. That's uh, right. Would you say that hip hop is like uh, American Dream personified? Meaning it started from the bottom and now it's like right up there with pop. I would say that about black music mm. in so many eras, like just, you know, gospel music, like coming out of, you know, slavery and just, you know, meaning much more than just the words in the song. Like it, it, it's root, deep rooted in, in, the, in your DNA. Mm -hmm. And then that evolving into like the blues, which was basically gospel songs with the words changed to talk about, 
you know, right. love and pain and stuff. And, and if you if you were back in the day singing the blues, your parents might be mad at you if they were like preachers. You know, you seen a uh, color purple, mm -hmm. Suge Avery. Like your daddy be mad as hell at you. You singing church songs because listen to the blues. It ain't nothing but church songs. And basically, uh, rhythm and blues was born out of that. Right. And and then you got jazz that goes left and the jazz cats when they was new and young that was the bad dudes that was the dudes who smoke weed the didn't have no damn jobs you didn't want mm -hmm. your damn daughter going out with no jazz me you didn't want your daughter hanging out with, with don't hang out with a bluesman don't date a bluesman all this stuff so yeah. you go into i mean all these genres of music and these different eras and stuff and then you get the hip-hop and it's like i just think it's like it's always been a way out mm -hmm. music you know these mm -hmm. different genres we we create I'm, in, and I, I don't even put music in the hands of black people. Because mm -hmm. if you go to any Motown record, it was always multi-culture. If you go to a lot mm -hmm. of, it was always somebody of, of different races working it to make it a hit. Mm -hmm. But I just say these songs, these vibes come out of black communities. Mm -hmm. Like house music, you know, is a mixture of some ghetto kids in right. Chicago, Chicago partying with some college kids, That's you right. know? And they found this medium. And the shit is the hottest shit in the world right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Some shit that was started at house right. parties. That's why it's called house music. Time you right. feel me? So, right. All EDM was was like house music, right? Yeah, they was just, you know, and they danced all night. That's if that you, Molly music, baby. Molly but music. Before that, it was, it was some shit. There are good kids and bad kids met in a place where they just had fun. Yeah. You say about gospel, that's why it's so cool that Kanye is doing that whole album and how he has, you know, his Sunday services where he's taking... R&B songs or rap songs and turning them into gospel mm -hmm. because it's so closely correlated. Let's compare hip-hop to sports. Okay. They get way more money than us, way easier. Mm -hmm. And we just pick football and basketball. And it, it seems like they got a better world. Because mm -hmm. they, you know, they're like, dude, got millions, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But if you like the turtle, the turtle and the fucking, uh, the, the hair, whatever the fuck the right, race right, is. Right, right, right. You know, them, them dudes be like, you know, they, they, they slip through the cracks. Right, a lot and of them, they can't be they self. Yeah, a lot That's of why them. a lot of them want to be rappers. Like when you rap, when you when you, on your song, um, just another day. Like that song resonates with me because like, you that song. Correct me if I'm wrong. That song was like pre hyphy yeah. right? But mm -hmm. you talk about like the origins of the hyphy movement, where the way they was driving their cars about, in yeah, the east, yeah. right? And and you talk about going to uh, Gary Payton's house. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want to be a rapper coach right now. Mm -hmm. I want to fucking still rap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if I'm playing ball at this point, I'm, my, I'm 53. What am I doing in the ball in, in the stadium? Mm -hmm. I'm coaching. I'm managing. I ain't playing. So I, I feel like I get to go around and still do shows and still get paid. Mm. I was doing house parties for $50 when I was 14, 15. Mm. Dang. I was doing shows for three hundred dollars when I was eighteen. You was, was you was making specific songs for people, right? Oh, I, I used to do the customized songs. Customized that's how, songs. That's how that's how we got <laughs> Oakland. That's that's how we really got the city. Right. Like literally, that's the how we got the city is um a guy who wanted to be a rapper who really was a drug dealer pulled up on me and my partner. And he was like, man, I. I got some good ass equipment at my house. You know, we used to mm -hmm. studios was somebody's house. Right. <laughs> Where you could get on the mic and then you hear yourself record it. It was mm -hmm. somebody's house. So he pulled us over. Sure enough, he got way better equipment than we had. And we hang around his house a little bit. And he's we're in the house where they sell um PCP. Mm. And the guy who's the boss man who runs the house, he don't never say shit to us. He's infamous for knowing how to box real good, mm -hmm. and he's a real gangster. Mm -hmm. So for one, he's all he's known for like if he get mad at you and he punch you, you probably gonna be asleep. Right. And if it's two, <laughs> he probably would shoot you too or whatever if he right. wanted to. He, I mean, he's just known for being you know that kind right. of guy. One day we uh, offered him a tape. He was like, he just went off like I don't want that shit. <laughs> oh, rap music ass shit. I don't right. like that shit. Like you know, OGs back then. They like to the play shit. They listen to some, some Motown and right. some Marvin Gaye or something. Right. He was like, I wouldn't. He said some Bloodstone. He said Stephanie I wouldn't. Mills. <laughs> he said I wouldn't listen to that shit if 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 it wasn't about me. Mm. And we was like, oh That's shit. It. And we we was terrified of this motherfucker. So we went we went home that day to our spot and made a song with his name in it mm. and just talk about his block and his crew and how, you know, his car and names and shit. Gave it to him, motherfucking didn't say thank you. Motherfucking never said I listened to it. He didn't say nothing. That's my homie right down to this day. He didn't say, he didn't say, oh, this shit don't nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I love telling this story, but man, we walking down the street one day, a little while after that, and the dude rolls up on us. His name was uh, King D. Mm -hmm. The white elders pulls up on us and he like, do you know who I am? He's mad. 
He like, nah, homie, you don't know. He a little bit bigger than us. He a little stocky right. motherfucker. He like, he was on 89th Avenue. He said, he said, you on my block. I run this block. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm tell you right now, if you motherfuckers don't make me one of them damn tapes like you made hot lips, you can't, you can't, you, like, he's like, you just can't beat in Oakland. Like, like, <laughs> he's like I'm fucking you up. <laughs> <laughs> so we take the little threat serious. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, we kind of like, <laughs> it wasn't like it wasn't really like fear. It was like okay, like let's just knock right. this shit out. So we um we shoot it. We come right back on his block, hand him a tape, and he gives us a, a twenty dollar bill. We didn't ask for no money. Mm -hmm. Just gives us a twenty. Mm -hmm. Then it just turned. We never really at first we weren't going around to people saying, "Do you want this?" Motherfuckers just kept pulling up on us. Mm. Like we'd be literally at the bus stop. <laughs> hey man, you too short, Freddie B. Yep, get in the car. Oh, <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> We're like okay. Pull over to some hood, some dude named Big Ice, like, yeah, I want one. Yes, yeah, mention my car, my other car, I mean, you know, the block, say the block. Right. And then we just started getting block. summons, man. And we had, I had a homie um, named Yogi. Mm -hmm. He was a respected dude all over the city. Mm -hmm. And he rode us around one day and he told, uh, he told everybody, these are my little homies. Uh -huh. He's like, anybody fuck with them, you got to answer to me. People mm -hmm. are scared of Yogi. He's, you know, the, 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 the blessing. Yeah. Once he said that, we got carte blanche to like pull up. We had already been doing it to certain little hoods selling tapes, but he was like, uh. And then all the kingpins wanted the tapes, and then it would it would be like, you could be a little soldier mm -hmm. and be mean mugging me like, Ooh, rap punk nigga, little, mm -hmm. little rap. And but the boss is like, leave him the fuck alone. <laughs> <laughs> so we DJ. That's called, that's called the power of the jam. Yeah, we DJ at parties. I learned early on, just go be friends with the boss. Mm -hmm. just like go I, be friends I, I applied that shit to every city I mm -hmm. touched down in. I'm like, I'm not gonna be friends with the workers. Mm. I'll be friends with y'all after me and the mm. boss get a report. Mm. Then I'll be cool. I'm not, I'm not going in through right. you. Now, you're born in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Cut your teeth in the Bay. Mm -hmm. I'm born in New York City, as Jasmine is. Hey, Long uh, Island, baby. Long Island. Let's talk, before we get out of here, a little bit about Tupac, because you had the honor and the privilege of having a relationship with this man. Mm -hmm. I met him once as a fan. I smoked a blunt with Big E and Tupac in a nightclub. That's dope. Back in the wow. day, with Funkmaster Flex with DJing. Um, Pox, born in New York. Mm -hmm. You had spent some time in DMV, right? I was born there. Born DMV. You got Pac, a lot of Baltimore in. Yeah, he went, he went to school in DMV. Jada Pinkett and them. Cut his teeth in the Bay. Became Tupac in the Bay. Mm -hmm. But then became a superstar in LA. He wanted that. He wanted that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Tell us about your relationship with Pac. He would have also equally have gotten that in New York. Because mm -hmm. he, I think at first he wanted it more in New York. He did. And part of his whole fuck New York thing was about so that that resentment yep it really was it mm -hmm. really was and so Pac to me was mm -hmm. the little homie mm -hmm. I um like you said you pull up in the bay and uh, Dale was working at the record store right I bought a keyboard at a music store from Shot G mm -hmm. when his name was like Greg or something like that yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Shock G. I just read He was Shock G. G. He was a key. He told me, he was like, I'm from in Florida. He lives in Florida now. He, but he was like, I'm from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He was like, he was like, he knew about me. He was like, man, I pimped my way across here and and I ended up in the music store and mm -hmm. I got I'm funky and all this stuff. And he was serious. Mm -hmm. So um I had a thing with Shock. Like mm -hmm. we that one little meeting and kind of knew, mm -hmm. you know, respect. Mm -hmm. And he immediately, like, it wasn't long from the time that I saw him that he became Digital Underground. Like mm -hmm. it was quick, do what you like, and they, they start coming mm -hmm. out. So um Tupac was a little homie in their crew. Mm -hmm. And our crews are really close. Digital Underground and the guys that I rode with. We weren't, like E-40's crew and my crew were connected to the streets through cocaine. Okay. But Digital Underground and Too Short, we was strictly connected through music. Okay. We, we, like, we had musicians. I had musicians, they had musicians. Right. Some of the guys- Shock is an incredible musician. Like two musicians, uh, Shorty B that played guitar and bass, mm -hmm. and Pee Wee that played keyboards mm -hmm. and everything else. Yeah. They both played for Digital Underground and played on tons of my songs. Mm -hmm. Lots of shit, like both groups. And through those two dudes, that's where the Tupac connection came. Because I'm like, I had this thing, bro, like, I kind of still got it. But I had this thing where my friends don't like my friends don't like my music friends. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can never mix them up. Right. So I can't, I can't be hanging with Tupac and then be like, oh, come roll me real quick. Mm -hmm. And take him over there, because then they're going to be like, I mean, you too far. Like, they're going to try to, like, get you to do stuff that, right, right. that I'm like, I don't want to be responsible for. Right. So I would keep the shit separated. And it, as soon as I finish rapping and dealing with music people, I jet, bleh, jet, bleh, blast over to where I'm at mm -hmm. and don't bring nothing rap with me. Because mm -hmm. they be, you know, they, it's just funny, man. They, they be like, man, 
it's my own homies, right? Mm -hmm. They were like, bro, you be on that rapper weirdo shit. <laughs> I'm like, right, I'm that's like, me. I'm the rapper weirdo shit. <laughs> yeah, I'm I know saying. what you're talking about. I know but, what you're talking about. But I'm hanging with all these little gangsters, all these little homies that do shit. They like, mm -hmm. you're a fucking rapper. Like, you know, it's, right. a, it's a thing. So, um, uh, the times where I did get to hang out with Tupac, it'd be Shorty B, Pee Wee, pull up on the studio. Um, you know, just I, 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 I'd like to tell people that every time I saw Tupac. He had like probably like four or five different distinct personas, and it was ran, ran, he would randomly be one of them. Mm -hmm. Like, like I knew accurate. him for a while before I saw him do an interview on BET, and he was talking all this militant, you know, Black Panther history type of stuff. And I was sitting there watching that, going, "What the fuck is that?" Like, <laughs> like, like I never seen him do that shit. Right. But then other times after that, you'd be with him, and he started. Drop, dropping some little knowledge or something. Like he could get quick he had into the knowledge. something. He had the book knowledge, he had the street knowledge. The other that. times, you know like in the Biggie movie where he like, oh, walk in with the lap. Yeah. He'd be that guy too, like fucking uh, blunt, cigarette, mm -hmm. Hennessy, and he'd just be that guy sometimes, talking shit, the, the, that Tupac. Then other times he'd be like this, you know. The glasses Tupac. So like a spiritual kind right. of brother who, super wise. And Me against of, the world Tupac. Yeah, for the ladies and right. shit. And, I mean, it just was, I, I hung out with Tupac one day where, you know, he was gangster Tupac, and I'm like, man, I, I was like, man, I don't, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> no, about that. He's like, and then other times, I've I, so much Tupac, man. Like, mm -hmm. Tupac was in Atlanta the same time as me. Mm -hmm. We get to Atlanta the mid 90s. He was shooting cops in Atlanta. He, he, did, he really did that. Yeah. And he was like a, a, a mythical guy, like, like literally, um, like, like women. Mm -hmm. Like, Tupac would leave like a trail of like, women who were like advertising for him and shit like <laughs> like they was I don't know he's like magic man he's the kind of dude who if we all in the room uh -huh. and no matter who's the hierarchy let him talk like let, right. let, him, let him have the stage because it's it just like ice tea or somebody like mm -hmm. don't try to out talk him let when, him what you just said about when he's room let him talk that's Yasin Bey most deaf vibes mm -hmm. that's what I think about when I'm most deaf when he's <laughs> in the room he got the floor that's, because you want to hear from him yeah exactly yeah so he was that guy that's that's the best thing I could say is, you know, that's the guy that you would like, kind of like, uh, be really famous around. Mm -hmm. And for a moment you go, well, I don't, don't want to be famous. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm gonna go play this little side, side right. thing and watch the show. Now in the Bay, um, there was always a special Bay Area thing, attachment to macking and mm -hmm. pimping and players. Now we had that in the East Coast, Big Daddy Kane was on that, you know, mm -hmm. Jay and Big was on that. Um, but for the Bay, it Isn't seems to me for now, it's like, like real pimping. Real pimping. <laughs> like now, in, in, certain, in certain cities, Chicago, Detroit, Memphis, certain Atlanta, pimping is big all over the all over it's the country. It's like give me your slice of pizza and your milk mm. in like in like fifth grade. Mm. <laughs> like, what is that? About? You want to be my girlfriend? Just, let me have your milk every day. Right now, you just said you talking about uh, a shock G from New Jersey. He's like, I pimp my way to the Bay. Mm. What is it about the Bay that attracts that? Um, you could ask a few people and get different things. But I think that um, there was a time where Oakland in general and certain parts of San Francisco were where you go in the city from the mm -hmm. outskirts to get your vices. Mm -hmm. Drugs, prostitution, whatever the fuck it may be. You mm -hmm. go in there clubbing. Oakland had clubs, you know, mm -hmm. certain parts of Frisco. It was, it was where you go to. You had the shit. So um, what we had in the Bay that was very prominent to what Evolve was, first and foremost, Oakland has the Port of Oakland, okay, which is way busier and way bigger than the Port of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So you bring in all the shit that's coming from the ocean through this little town. Right. I feel that. I figure that's why the Hells Angels want to set up shop. That's that why. connects o <laughs> Oakland to New York and Miami. Exactly. Yeah. To like cities like Baltimore. Like Baltimore, why can Baltimore right. have money because you got an open way to the ocean. Mm -hmm. If your your city can touch the ocean, right. you get money. So that's one factor. Then you have um. There's a, there was an Oakland Army base. Mm -hmm. There was a, a Alameda is the city right next to Oakland. Mm -hmm. Really tiny cities. The Alameda Naval Base, and then right up there where E40 then was at in the city next to Vallejo is a city called Fairfield, mm -hmm. which is about 30 minutes outside of Oakland, and it's uh, the Travis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. So mainly, I got this kind of from my father. He, he, he never lived in Oakland. But he was like, you go up to Oakland, you go down to 7th Street, party, blah, blah, you know, describing to me what it was like before I ever lived there. Mm -hmm. And I've heard other OGs in Oakland talk about how certain parts of Oakland was literally, you know, drugs and prostitution. That's where mm -hmm. you come to. 
You want to come go to the club, hang out at some little bar, get you, you know. So if you're a military guy, and it's I just named you three bases. There's right. a lot going on, right. on on the weekends. That's interesting. Yeah. So you know somebody got to be in there catering. Yeah. And that's what you get. You get this mentality. And when I moved to Oakland, it was a good five years before crack is what we know it to be, mm -hmm. like the damaging monster that it is. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, uh, crack was called free base. Right. And you had Richard Pryor and all these people doing it. Right. And it was a prestigious. Got burnt it was up. prestigious. It was like a thing that you had to have money to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, when crack is like, you're a crackhead. Freebasing right. was like some elite shit. Right. And even though it was very, the same addiction, it never, you know, Richard Pryor didn't tell you stories about sitting with the, with the lamp, uh, the lamp right, candle right. burning. They was cracked the fuck out, but it was called Freebase. <laughs> she was in the first season of um, Snowfall. Snowfall. Yeah. And in that first season, they talked, they, they make a journey up to, to Oakland mm -hmm. to I fuck know, with know, the Freebase. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a little that. bit accurate. We, we had all the bad shit. We had all the shit to come up to the bay and get all the bad shit and t to Oakland, and it just it just became a, a very very powerful city of lots of economic uh, opportunities mm. in the, in the early stages, and it was like um, I mean it was like people was getting real money like you can't have a town, a city with population four hundred fifty thousand and you've got you know. 20, 30 millionaire drug dealers? Mm -hmm. Like, how, where was all this money coming from? Mm -hmm. It's not coming from Oakland. It's coming from the fucking suburbs. That's right. Coming into the city. And then you go read the new Jim Crow. Yeah, Michelle mm -hmm. Alexander. Uh, I sell that at my website, qualityclub.com. I have a bookstore in Kiru Books. We sell that book. And it mentions Oakland a lot. It does. And it's like, at the time, it's mentioning very significant things going down in the time of I'm a high school, I'm 19, I'm 20. I'm like, I know this shit. I was in this shit. Like, mm -hmm. it, it, it hurts to mm. realize that you were kind of like, you know, the guinea pig, you know? Mm. Like the, an experiment as far as what would crack do, as mm. far as what we do, what, what happens if we uh, change the laws and police different? Right. Like it just, it, it became mass incarceration. Like, mm -hmm. like we helped them make the formula for that shit. New you know? slavery about right. how to police, and, it, and it's like, it's legal, but it's not. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, you're gonna fucking criminalize the shit to that effect. And what, what you end up with, you end up, you fuck the shit up. Mm -hmm. It's fucked up. Yeah. It's fucked up, because we had a balance in the hood. We had a major balance that every hood had, and it was called kingpins. And it was fucking, it was law, the law. You don't fucking go against what a kingpin says. Mm -hmm. You don't rob the old lady, and you don't fucking shoot so-and-so for no reason. Mm -hmm. Nothing goes down without mm -hmm. being, without supposed to go it's down. It's a code. Or you, out of, or you violate it. Right. So after that, we lost the kingpins. Then we had all these, uh, you know, these second guy in charge, third guy in charge becoming the boss, and they wasn't cut out for that. Then you had no bosses. Mm. And then you end up with um, a generation of kids, like, who's, my daddy got killed. My daddy was in jail the lost before boys. I was born. And they, who raised you? My grandma raised me. Who raised you? I raised me. Like, right. what the fuck? <laughs> like, or hip hop, like hip hop raised me. It, man, and it's, it's so, um, it's something that we don't talk about when we talk about all the problems. We're like, you know, shit, yo, you put us in this situation, man. Like, literally, it was the opportunity, man. I, Kingpins told you, you're going to sell dope. You're going to play ball. You stay your ass in school. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And you get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really believe like uh, we should have bought the hood. We had a chance. We could at least own the real estate. And now you look at my Mexican homies, what they do. Mm -hmm. As soon as they get a block, they get one house by it. They buy the next house. They buy the whole Main Street. Mm -hmm. Every fucking thing. So, Kingpin is a character. That that name Kingpin is a character in the Marvel universe. Mm -hmm. Ryan Coogler is from Oakland. Mm -hmm. In the Black Panther movie, Oakland mm -hmm. is a character in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like this. He opened the movie with a two short song too. That's right. And your a two short song opens in the black in the in the in, in the trunk. In the trunk. Did you know that he was going to use it? No, I did not know. I was surprised at everybody else because movies like that don't really get you don't get previews. Right. Mm. That was so fucking flattering. <laughs> For real. That 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 movie that whole Wakanda Black Panther thing and it, it was like connected with Oakland. It opened up a lot of people to Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. um, what is the future for Oakland? 
Uh, well, in the light of cities like Oakland and Brooklyn being forced to uh, embrace gentrification, you look at it, I look at it from two different angles. I look at it as, um, you know, the, the, the relocation of certain people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the downside. You go, well, you gentrify an area, you got to relocate somebody. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are moving out to those old raggedy suburb houses that the, the reverse, it's like reverse white flight. Mm -hmm. That's reverse going on. Reverse white flight. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> the suburbs that they ran to are now ghettos, mm -hmm. some of them. And then, you know, downtown areas and areas that are close to economics, which used to be like, you know, you go downtown, even though the, the corporate was there, mm -hmm. you still, it was ghetto on the streets mm -hmm. in certain cities. So now we get in this little facelift. And on one end, a guy like me can come in there, you can't keep me out. You can't economically source, outsource me or, or, right. or, or block me out. Right. I'm in. I'm in. And I'm like, you, I'm going to indulge. I might get a fly apartment down on, on the water in Oakland. I might, you know, go to the best restaurants now in Oakland. Mm -hmm. So many of them. Walk up in the white bar and, or the Asian bar and drink with the, and just be like, hey, what's right. up, y'all? But that's not given to everybody. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's so powerful, bro. Like, we had the, the, the governor of California come to Oakland to be the mayor for one term. That's right. And basically he just did it for money. He did it to, he, he started the gentrification movement. He put all this shit in, in motion where you get all the permits and shit, but never did a Hispanic or a black person get to be on the, on the uh, construction crew or, mm -hmm. or get the bid or anything for a certain job or you know utilize this company, local company. Mm -hmm. he, he called in his homies and they made a lot of fucking money mm -hmm. starting the early days of gentrification now. Now that it's in motion, it's like, you know, you can't stop the mind. It's like the blob, you mm. know, like it's probably, I think it's just the opposite of white flight. Like, like when you like, I have to move. Like it's just, you don't have to move, but you've got to move because you can't afford it. So it's the same fucking thing. No doubt. You know? And it, we like right next door to San Francisco. So they not, they call in the West Oakland, uh, South San Francisco. So, no, they call in the, <laughs> they call in the East San Francisco. Some, some little the name same, they got for same it. Same thing happened in Brooklyn. They changed names of the neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah. You know what it is. You represent old school Oakland. Yes, Shout sir. out to the Bay Area's own Too Short People's Party. Mm -hmm. We love Too Short at the People's Party. Give it up. Bitch. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs>